Let me go ahead and say from the outset that this is going to be a rather lengthy introduction to the subject of why it is that we have been deceived by the Congressional Black Caucus and the danger that it serves to have others speaking for you. If the immigrant blacks wish to speak for themselves, that's fine, but they cannot speak for us because we do not come from a common cultural or historical experience. We do not have a common bond, and that's what we're going to be discussing here. Now, this is going to be a lengthy introduction because I'm going to be reading from a book called The Tigers of Tammany. I've told you about it before. And it's important that we discuss this in particular because you need to understand how white supremacy works when it's trying to erase a group of people, especially over a course of time, to carry out a guilt-free genocide. You devour them physically by killing them off or strangling them for resources so as to dwindle their numbers. And then along the way, what you're doing is you're devouring them culturally and socially too. Whatever they've contributed, whatever their culture is, you're eating that too. You're eating up whatever it is that these people are. You're taking on their practices and you're taking on certain aspects of their behavior, not because you like them, not because you're trying to continue their cultural legacy, but precisely because this is part of the devouring process. You're absorbing them in everything except physically because you're trying to eliminate them physically and you'll just have a few pieces of whatever their culture was because it's vibrant to try to inject some life into your own dying, desiccated culture. You see this all over the place, especially with those of us who survived slavery here in America. Foundational black culture has been just completely ripped off and appropriated and had its, drud its blood drained and, and million other violations. But it's not the all here in the United States where this happens. You also find that there are white Australians and New Zealanders who will take on the tribal dances of the Maori people while they're wiping them out and still strangling them for resources. But at their football games, their little soccer games, they'll start off their games with doing one of those tribal dances. You'll have a bunch of white guys out there with a few of the black fellas, quote unquote, and they'll start off with a traditional Maori war dance. This for people who they're trying to wipe out. So just understand, that's how this works. Now, why is this the case? Now, every thief steals, but the really clever thieves, the really slick ones, the really sophisticated thieves, like white supremacists and their operatives try to do, is to legitimize their theft. Notice the wording that I used. Legitimize. I didn't say justify. A man who has not eaten in a couple of days and who steals some food from a market that man would justify it by saying, I was hungry. He's justifying the threat, but he's not legitimizing it. On the other hand, when you have somebody who claims, yeah, I know I didn't have anything to do with the 15th Amendment or the Voting Rights Act or Brown v. Board, but you know what? I went to school because of those laws, and because of that, um, I think that I'm the best person to speak for all of you people who did fight for all of these changes, and, uh, well, you know, um, I like Dr. King as much as you do, and hey, what about Malcolm X's mother, and what about Shirley Chisholm, and hey, Marcus Garvey didn't come out of American slavery, so... You, if you had no problem with them, you can't have a problem with me. You got all these clowns trying to grandfather claws themselves into our history and looking for any flimsy, feeble tactic they can use to legitimize their own duplicity and treachery against us, because that's what's going on. You got people trying to lay claim to our history, trying to steal our place in the world. And they're trying to legitimize it, meaning to make it right. This is the right thing to do. This is supposed to happen. This is right. That's what legitimize means. Now, if you want an example of that, keep in mind, they're taking the playbook right out of white supremacy. Literally, there's a book that I told you about, which you can still get online, called Tigers of Tammany. I've mentioned it in the past. And main reason that um, I want to bring it up for this evening's video essay is because of the fact that back this book was written in 1967. I got a lot of books that were that basically a lot of them start in the 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, and some before that. And it's a matter of why does Professor Black Truth collect all these old books? And that's the, and the reason for that happens to be it's way before the internet, way before what we would, even those of us who were Generation X who grew up with um, the beginning of computer indexing. Before all that, you had to, when you want to do a history book, you had to go to the original archives. 
That's part of the reason why so many academics or people who had worked in government, like at the Smithsonian and such, why these were largely people who were involved in the writing of these books, if not the collation of the information. Because you had to go to you had to go to actual source documents, stuff that was kept in archives, stuff that you couldn't go to the library to get, because it wasn't in books that had already been published. The book itself starts off with a white man being inducted into the Society of St. Tammany. Now, I'm not entirely sure when this takes place. It probably most likely took place in the early 19th century. But the point that I'm trying to make is Tammany is a Native American name. It was That's the name of a Native American chieftain. His name was actually Tamarand, but by the time they were done bastardizing it, it was Tammany. And that's where Tammany Hall comes from. You got a bunch of white guys here who are running around with an organization named after a Native American chieftain. This is typical of white supremacy. Part of how they legitimize their theft is by actually devouring the people through warfare. You're, you're chewing them up to nothing. And then afterwards, you're also devouring their culture. This is the reason why cultural appropriation is so damnable. This is genocide taking place. This is what the world they're doing because they're not doing it because they like you. They're doing it because they're attempting to absorb you and erase you. And the only thing that will be left will be just a couple old wives' tales and whatever few fragments of what you did. They'll take away whatever they feel is dynamic and vibrant about your culture so they can prop up their own empty, desiccated, and dying culture of their own. But the truth is, it's vampirism. Now, the Tigers of Tammany starts off with the induction ceremony, and I know that this is going to take a while. That's part of the reason why I'm posting this separately. This is admittedly a prelude to the entire video essay regarding the Immigrant Black Caucus in general, but I think that it's important that we go over this step by step because I want you to see how long this has been going on because these are rituals and such that go all the way back to the 18th century. In fact, about the time that the Constitution was being written, so the idea of the Europeans attempting to try to appropriate the Native Americans in some way goes back way before $5 Indians. Now here's the beginning of the book. In the great wigwam of the island of Manhattan, two columns of fiercely painted braves stood silently, their eyes fixed on the closed curtain. Behind the curtain, the sagamore of the tribe, tomahawk in hand, the badge of a soaring eagle over his heart, interrogated a trembling pale face. Are you a citizen of the United States? The sagamore asked in perfect English. Etho. The captive replied, hoping to curry favor through his knowledge of the Indian tongue. Are your intentions friendly and honorable? The Sagamore persisted. Etho. And are you a lover of freedom? Etho. The tribe's Wiskinki, a surly-looking brave with two large keys hooked to his belt, walked behind the curtain. He too wore a badge, this one depicting a great eye over a door with the words inscribed, No slave nor tyrant enters. After a moment, the Wiskinki reappeared from behind the curtain and moved quickly to a door at the opposite end of the wigwam. John Morton, the Wiskinki shouted to the door. From behind the door, a deep voice acknowledged the name of the white stranger. The Wiskinki returned to the curtain and whispered to the Sagamore. A moment later, the Sagamore emerged and walked between the two columns of braves to the door. He knocked three times. Two times sounded in reply. The Sagamore returned to his prisoner behind the curtain. Suddenly the wigwam resounded with voices raised in song. Sacred the ground where freedom is found, and virtue stamps his name. Our hearts entwine at friendship's shrine, and union fans the flame. Our hearts sincere shall greet you here with joyful voice. Confirm your choice, Etho, Etho, Etho. The curtain was rapidly drawn aside. The man named John Morton was pushed forward. His path between the two lines of braves was lighted by two men carrying torches. Behind them came the sagamore bearing a cap of liberty perched on a tall staff. As John Morton walked the gauntlet forward to block his way. The man in the middle, the father of the council, raised his tomahawk above the prisoner's head. The tomahawk came crashing down. In the nick of time, the Sagamore deflected the blow of the tomahawk with his liberty staff. Sago Sago Sagamore, asked the father of the council, raising the tomahawk to strike again. Sago Sago Oli, the Sagamore replied. Is this stranger worthy of a seat among us? The father of the council asked in English, still brandishing his tomahawk. Etho, said the Sagamore. Does he love freedom? Etho. 
Will he unbury the tomahawk from beneath the great wigwam before his country's good requires it? Yata. Will he bear adversity, torture, and death in defense of liberty like a true son of Tammany? Etho. The father of the council dropped his tomahawk to his side. Conduct him, Sagamore, to our great Sakim. The small procession of torchbearers, Sagamore, and frightened stranger continued along its way between the two columns of braves to the door. Grand Sackham, the Sagamore addressed the door. This stranger has given the fullest assurance of his sincere intentions to support the harmony, reputation, constitution, and laws of this society, and it is therefore recommended that he be adopted as a brother. The door opened, the great Sackham, mightiest of the tribe, stepped out. A hush fell over the wigwam. The great Sackham glared at the pale face, then he spoke softly. Friend, the favorable reports given of your character and intentions have recommended you to the acceptance of this society. The Sagamore handed the staff with the cap of liberty to the Grand Sackham, who held it over the head of John Morton. John Morton, intoned the Grand Sackham, you do freely declare that you will support the harmony, reputation, constitution, and laws of this society, and preserve inviolably all its secrets from the knowledge of others. John Morton raised his left hand. Etho, he replied. The Grand Sackham returned to the assembled braves. Brothers, are you satisfied with the declaration and obligation of the candidate? The braves stamped their feet in unison. Etho, they cried. Now the Wiskinky walked over to John Morton and bent toward him expectantly. Morton whispered in his ear, Liberty is our life. The Wiskinky whispered back, May you ever enjoy it. John Morton placed his left hand over his heart, and the Wiskinky repeated the gesture. Then Morton extended his left hand and interlocked forefingers with the Wiskinky in the tamanial grip of brotherhood. The Grand Sackham spoke. I now confirm you as a son of Tammany and member of the Columbian Order. The new brave was led to a leather-bound volume where he signed John Morton to the Constitution of the Society of St. Tammany. It was now two hours past the setting of the sun on the third day of the second moon, season of snows, the year of discovery 347 of Independence 63 and of the Institution 50. The Grand Sackham turned once more to his tribe. Would you now be willing to lose this brother? The Braves stamped their feet. Yata, they cried. Now, if you're wondering where all that strangeness was from, it happened to be part of the details, it happened to be part of the rituals that were kept by Tammany's membership. And it was donated to Columbia University in 1965. They kept records of these little rituals. Who was there? What was said? They kept rituals of this stuff going back to the late 18th century. So if you want to know what the world was going on, why the Freemasons, white guys, have no problem running around in black Egyptian attire, naming themselves after Egyptian organizations. Now you know why. Here these guys are, freely interchanging the names of Native American, Native American authority figures and an organization named after a Native American chieftain, but calling itself the Columbian Order. Columbia, that's freaking Christopher Columbus. So you see what the hell it is they're doing there. You see what's going on. This is important because I want you to understand this is what they've been doing for hundreds of years now. They've been doing this for hundreds of years. Devouring the cultures of the people who they come across and appropriating it as their own and trying to add legitimacy to their theft by saying, oh, we, we call our, we call our place not a, we don't call it a hall, we don't call it a temple, we call it a wigwam. And uh, we don't call this guy here the president or the organization. We call him the Grand Sakim. That's what we call him. Oh, why, this organization was named after a Native American chieftain, so you can't say that we just hated the Native Americans and slaughtered these Indians. You, why, it's more complex than that. Did you know that my great-grandfather was part Native American? I mean, you see the game going on here. Ain't got a damn thing to do with respecting those who they wiped out. It's all about legitimizing what they've done. And I recognize that that was kind of the long way around to approach that. 
But the thing is, that's important to me because that sticks out to me and I want it to stick out to you so you can understand how long they've been doing this. Now, on to the Black Immigrant Caucus. Pew Research performed a study last year listing the members of Congress who were either immigrants or second generation. But as I've always taught you, when it comes to us as foundational blacks, we have to do our own research. We can't just be sitting here thinking that the people who enslaved us and that the propaganda arm of white supremacy, which Pew Research is part of, that they're going to be actually trying to do us any favors. White media, and this includes white think tanks like Pew Research, they're only going to scrape the surface, and mostly for the sake of legitimizing their program, not for the sake of exposing what they're really doing. Besides, their job is to protect tools of white supremacy, and few tools are as valuable as the black misleadership class. They are crucial to confusing and undermining our internal politics. Now, you see some of the usual suspects among the list, like Kamala Harris and Ilhan Omar, but you see a few others, like Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who was born in Brooklyn, but her parents are from Jamaica, just like Kamala Harris. Yvette Clark has said practically nothing about black people and absolutely nothing about a black agenda. Sheila Jackson Lee has been exposed as the white power tool she's always been. Something about Jamaica seems to make them especially attractive to white power to be their puppets. Congressman Anthony Brown, he was born in New York, but his mother is a white woman from Switzerland and his father an Afro-Cuban. Congressman Joe Negussi, his parents are both from Eritrea. Congressman Stephen Horsford, born in Las Vegas, but his parents are immigrants from Trinidad. The problem with Pew Research, of course, is that as part of the white media, they don't go in depth. They just do a quick blink and you'll miss it mention and then run along. But this is the black media. We dig way beyond the surface. Now I'm going to do a quick listing of them off top, and then we're going to go in depth with each of them. Congressman Delgado of New York. His father is Puerto Rican. Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland, who used to be that state's former lieutenant governor. His mother is a white woman from Switzerland, and his father is an Afro-Cuban. So how the hell did he wind up with an Anglo name then? Because Anthony Brown is neither Swiss nor Cuban. Well, they didn't do it so that he could seem American, because American means white. The reason they did it was to help him pass as one of us because they understood exactly what, what advantages America was going to give him by virtue of his bloodline, which didn't go back to the plantations. Congressman Joe Neguse of Colorado, his parents are from Eritrea, and his wife is Hispanic. This man has done nothing, absolutely nothing, for black people. He talks the same colorblind nonsense that he knows casual racists, read white moderates, want to hear. They want an immigrant who doesn't mention America's sins and crimes against black people. You can rail on about anything you want, except for foundational black folks and what we're owed. This menagerie of clowns, as I started going through their bios, it was like watching a non-stop monster movie, just villain after villain. Though it became particularly interesting when I got to Stephen Horsford, and yes, he immediately made me think of Stephen from Django. He co-sponsored House Resolution 15, a bill that would be giving blanket amnesty to all illegal aliens in the U.S., so he showed that his top priority was and is not black Americans, not foundational blacks, but immigrants. His record is the kind of anti-foundational black nonsense you would expect from a white power puppet. But it was when I looked into his spouse that things really got interesting. Congressman Horsford is married to Sonia Horsford, a so-called academic who has a degree in educational leadership, whatever that means. She also majored in speech communication. Not sure what exactly that qualifies her to do, but white power doesn't pick its operatives based on credentials. She's currently a professor at Columbia University. See how Columbia's name keeps coming up over and over again? When it comes to how white power is steeped, it's no accident that Columbia's name comes up so much. Because you want to know who else was a professor at Columbia? Barack Obama. He taught constitutional law there. Yep. These white institutions of lower learning have a fetish for biracials who they indoctrinate with all kinds of anti-black nonsense and then push into our community claiming that they're one of us. 
As you can see, this Sonia Horsford doesn't have much color to her skin at all. I immediately wanted to know where she's from. I can't find it. I wanted to know about her parents. Not much info on them either, except for a Twitter post that she made, which linked to an Instagram picture. A black man and an Asian woman. You know, for someone who's so proud of her parents, she's gone out of her way not to say one piddling word about them. Now, you can love whomever you want, but there's a reality here. We don't live in a contextless vacuum. What defines the context of the world we live in are group power dynamics, and right now all of those dynamics are controlled or overwhelmingly influenced by white supremacy. And black people as a group have no power. So when some type of conflict arises, it's a hell of a lot more likely that you'll go in the direction of your non-black significant other than that they'll go in the direction of black society. That's the reality. Are the interests of this non-black wife the same as the black community? Because we do have interests. The Asian community certainly has their interests, and allying themselves with us isn't one of them. Taking Sonia Horsford's parents as a case study, even if this Asian woman is the purest of the pure and the nicest of the nice, so what? She isn't in a position to lead Asian people. She is only representative of herself. This is why I don't waste time with black people who like to bring up their non-black friend who they're cool with, or some non-black boyfriend or girlfriend or acquaintance who they claim to be cool with. Your exceptional pal is exactly that. An exception. Your one non-black friend is one person, and you can't have an alliance with one person. As foundational blacks, we are a group. And groups don't have alliances with one person, unless that person is someone of the caliber of Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. We live under a system of white supremacy, and that supremacy is not defined by anti-Asian racism. It is defined exclusively by anti-black racism. And if you want to be more specific than that, exclusively anti-foundational black racism. And while you're busy looking for true love, white supremacy is plotting how to wipe you and all the other black folks out. Not how to wipe the Asians out. They're trying to figure out how to wipe black people out. Also, when you look at Sonya Horsford's t Twitter timeline, you see her pushing that fraud about a black-brown alliance. Gee, have you ever noticed how the only time that we see Hispanics talking about police violence against black people is when they're trying to finesse us into supporting more of them being brought into the country? When they're trying to finesse us into supporting what is nothing less than amnesty, then all of a sudden they give a blink and you'll miss it mention to police violence against black people. Of course, what they never mention is either George Zimmerman or Officer Yanez in Minnesota who murdered Philando Castile, or any of the other Hispanic police officers who decide to enact violence against black people. Their names never come up. The same way that you can be married to an Asian person, but you notice when it came time for the Asian community to step up for Peter Liang, they did it across the board. Nobody in the Asian community was sticking up for Akai Gurley, who, by the way, was descended from immigrants, just for the record. You take a look at how these Hispanic communities have treated black people either in their home countries or elsewhere. Just take a look at how they treat black people here in the U.S. And then they turn around and say, you should support more Hispanics being brought into the country so black folks can get more such treatment. No, when it comes to the mythical black-brown alliance, the Latinos clearly get the better end of that deal. And yet it's a deal that Sonia Hornsford is advocating for. So Sonia Hornsford is only interested in what would benefit immigrants, legal or not. And look at this asinine little saying here. Tu Luca is my Luca. Actually, it's not. My fight is against immigrants who come to the U.S. to carry out anti-black racism and anti-black violence. Is that the fight of these Hispanic communities? I don't think so. And this is what a congressman's wife posts. None of this reflects what black people think. None of this reflects what black people have demanded. And people like Sonia Hornsford and her husband know that. So even if you want to try to say that Stephen Hornsford's not as bad as all that, you see what the world his wife does. 
while he's busy giving you some of Dr. King's greatest hits, he's giving you the quotable Dr. King, and he's sitting here talking about Jim Crow and other things that he thinks are going to blind you to the scam, you see what his wife is out there doing. Understand that the black misleadership class was an invention of white supremacy. They're not there to reflect our interests. They are there to get us to work against our interests or to sit on our hands while white supremacy continues apace. They are there to be the black face to sell us white lies. They are there to always try to talk us into inaction when bold action is what's called for. So for those of you out there who think to yourselves that it doesn't matter who it is that you happen to be in love with, it does matter under white supremacy because nothing happens in a vacuum under white supremacy. And being a black person, you can't afford to go through life being casual. Your color matters, as does your bloodline. So the further your bloodline moves away from a foundational black, a survivor of slavery in the U.S., the further that you're moving away from our history, our struggle, and the common bond that came out of coming from a common experience. Your experience did not come from Asians who came over for after Vietnam. It didn't happen. Your bloodline and your common experience is not with Koreans or with Japanese immigrants or Chinese immigrants or Hispanics coming in across the Rio Grande. Your experience with people who came out of slavery. That's important because those Hispanic communities are not pretending as if they've got something in common with you. Those Asians are not pretending like they got something in common with you. So why are you trying to pretend as if you don't have something in common with yourself? So no, I'm afraid that the Asian wife most likely cannot understand where we're coming from. And I say that based on the behavior of the group that she comes from. I look at the group's behavior, that group's attitude toward us. And then you look at Sonya Hornsford. She's half black, but you look at what she writes, what she proclaims, and she talks like any other white liberal that you ever heard. Hell, her books are co-authored by white people, so there you go. Congressman Horsford's wife has written all kinds of tripe, such as intersectional identities and educational leadership of black women in the USA. Did you uh, catch that title? Intersectional identities. Now, haven't I always warned you about words like intersectional? These were terms created by white power and put into the mouths of black so-called academics. And you notice that those black academics usually come from a culture outside of foundational black culture. You got a bunch of people who are either who consider themselves to be primarily LGBT or immigrants or biracials. Intersectional is a political term meant to attack us. Congressman Hornsford's wife is the typical white power shill trying to drive wedges between black people on the basis of gender, because that's why the European enslaved us, wasn't it? Because our ancestors were all women, right? You see the game that she's playing here? She's showing up and trying to push all sorts of dogma and ideology that serves to fracture the black community. You want to know why it is that we happen to have tangibles on the record now as part of American politics? It's because black men and black women have worked together. They put aside all the lies that the Europeans were trying to use and decide we're getting behind this message. This is the same thing that happened in the 1860s and was successful to bring down chattel slavery, but it also happened again in the 1960s and failed because a lot of black women decided that they were going to fragment themselves and try to jump on the feminist bandwagon. And you see that people like Congressman Horsford's wife are trying to figure out if the feminism tactic still has some miles left in it. She praises black feminism in her books and she rails against the patriarchy and all the rest of it. I'm sure there's plenty more stupidity from this woman, but I've seen enough. I didn't even bother to go through Stephen Horsford's Twitter timeline, believe it or not, because seeing his wife's Twitter feed was more than enough. And if you thought the insanity from Stephen Horsford's wife was outrageous, you ain't seen nothing yet. Next, we're going to take a closer look at Congressman Antonio Delgado of New York. As I told you, he's half black, half Puerto Rican. Now, here's a picture of him with his wife. Not sure what ethnicity she is? That's understandable, because she doesn't know either. And I'm not making that up. Four years ago, Lacey Schwartz, as she was known then, had a story run about her in the Telegraph. 
She was born in New York City and raised to think that she was a white Jew. As she states in the article, quote, I came from a long line of New York Jews. We went to the synagogue, bar mitzvahs, Hebrew school. Yeah, but her Jewish relatives and the rest of the Jewish community, they didn't feel the need to play along with what was an obvious lie. They knew she wasn't white and they occasionally made little digs at her, calling her an Ethiopian Jew and the like. Lacey's mother would go on later to admit that she had indeed had an adulterous affair with a black man, which of course led to the destruction of her marriage. Well, it does make perfect sense when you think about it. After all, the word Schwartz, it does mean black in German. Hey, you know I had to mention that little fact. And Lacey gives an interesting window into the utter chaos of being biracial and how confused they often are. Hearing her talk about race is like listening to two schizophrenics having an argument. She claims that racial identity is fluid and contextual. There goes that intersectional crap. That train is never late. She then goes on to say racial identity can change depending on where you are and who you're around. Now, in what world does that make any sense? Tell me, at what point can Denzel Washington claim that he's a white man? After all, racial identity is fluid and contextual, and it changes depending on where you are and who you're around. So Denzel Washington works around mostly white folks, so he can go ahead and claim that he's white, right? See, the one-drop rule simply means that your status as white, i.e. white privileges, can be revoked arbitrarily. Doesn't matter if you're blonde haired and blue eyed and your parents came from Sweden going back a hundred generations. If you have one black person or if in your bloodline or if you're deemed to have had a black person in your bloodline, then your white card is revoked. Racial identity is not fluid because the flow only goes one way. People who wanted to be white but were cast off and thrown in the same category as black people. And even Lacey Schwartz knows that, too. If you want to see how this woman contradicts herself from sentence to sentence because her head is so screwed up. Next in the article, she says two diametrically opposed things. That being biracial is, in fact, a category of being black. But then she says that it's an inclusive thing. Now, notice that. You want to see how it is the white supremacy weaponizes ethnicity. They take people who they have basically taken their minds and just confused them and spun them into jelly. And then they take these people and say they're part of the black community. These people who are so confused and in many cases full of self-hate. And then you put them into the black community so that they can just cause all sorts of confusion and all sorts of disorder because that's what happens. This woman contradicts herself from one sentence to the next. She doesn't know whether she's coming or going. She just got through describing being biracial as a one-way street, one that precludes you being white, but then she claims that it's inclusive. Now, I want you to ask yourselves this question. What attracted Antonio Delgado to this woman? A woman who thinks race is fluid. Acknowledges, however, that this fluidity only goes one way, but still insists that it's inclusive somehow. Inclusive of what and of whom? How do you push a black agenda with a man who is clearly running from blackness and a woman who thinks black is whatever you want it to be? This is who and what white power installed as the black misleadership class. This is what's wrong with the Congressional Black Caucus. This is who claims to speak for you and me. What do we have in common with this menagerie of self-hating anti-black lunatics? Even the members of the CBC who are not necessarily immigrants or descended from immigrants, at least not that we found yet, they cape all the damn time for immigrants. Cedric Richmond of Louisiana went on Twitter and he was demanding that illegal aliens from Vietnam be protected from deportation because they played a major role in my district and in cities all across America. Well, you can tell that there happens to be a couple of campaign contributions, but the thing is, this is about more than money. The reason this Richmond clown is talking like this is because of ideology. 
this guy is trying to basically bury the black community. He's trying to ignore the black community. This guy wants to make it clear to his white paymasters, I know what my job is. I'm going to carry water for white supremacy. I'm not here to represent black folks. I want them, I want them to just be completely and thoroughly ignored. And this stance is doubly stupid because there is no Vietnamese voting block in Louisiana. It's literally almost entirely black and white. Sure, there's a few enclaves, especially in South Louisiana, but not enough to matter electorally. But this guy doesn't give a damn about the black part of his constituency. How about Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of the Congressional Black Talkers? His uncle is the esteemed Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Yes, that Dr. Leonard Jeffries. Well, the apple fell far from the tree on this one. Then you got Congresswoman Johanna Haynes. The white media was so eager to praise her as being a teacher, but that's not true. She's actually an administrator now. She hasn't been a teacher in forever, but the white media calls her a teacher anyway. This reminds me of the whole Joe the Plumber con that the Republicans tried back in 2008. However, they're not, the white media is not so eager to mention that Johanna Haynes' husband is a cop. Kind of reminds you of how frequent MSNBC mouthpiece Jason Johnson's mother is in law enforcement, but that doesn't get mentioned much. And of course, we must deal with the stupidity of Ayanna Presley. Remember how she made a proper fool of herself calling that group of absolute irrelevant females her squad, clearly the losing team. She's trying to raise her own pathetic profile. She was out there with Ilhan Omar and that Talib woman and Alexandria Cortez. Ayanna Presley's not an immigrant. She's not even the children of immigrants, nor the grandchild of immigrants. So far, she seems to basically be descended from foundational blacks, though you damn sure couldn't tell by how she was out there caping for immigrants the other day. This is a disgrace for her to do that, because you damn sure don't see that Talib woman holding press conferences about the treatment of black people held without trial and often dying behind bars. You take a look at the infamous Rikers Island. How many of those prisoners there kept in solitary confinement, sometimes often for years, how many of them are black? How many of them did that Talib woman say one piddling word for? And yet you got Ayanna Presley putting on the cape for people who aren't even American citizens. Where was Ilhan Omar at to demand prosecution for police or self-appointed killers of black people? Where was she at? Hell, this woman couldn't even be bothered to stick up for a fellow Somali in Mohammed Noor. Not even a police do a dangerous job and blue lives matters from her. You've got to balance the taken with the given family, and I only do business with others to the extent that they do business with me. If you stick up for me a lot, then I'll stick up for you a lot. You only stick up for me a little, or only when you want something from me, then I'm only going to stick up for you a few times, or only when I'm trying to get something. And if you don't stick up for me at all, then you can guess how often you're going to see me, especially when Donald Trump comes for you. But from these immigrant communities, their behavior towards foundational blacks goes far beyond merely not sticking up for us. From Koreans who murder black children allegedly over shoplifting, to Latinos who murder black teenagers over a can of iced tea, at what point do they acknowledge our humanity and stick up for us? When are we going to see these immigrant communities out there campaigning for us? We've already seen the answer, and it is never. Because those immigrant Asians did not have one word of sympathy or support for Akai Gurley. Why? Because as far as they were concerned, he was killed by an Asian, so right or wrong, they're sticking with Peter Liang. And for Ayanna Presley to do this is a damnable thing one that she shouldn't be forgiven for. The white media will use this unthinking twit and present her as speaking for all of us. This is why you need the black media. I told you white power invested its enormous resources into creating entire constellations of black tools. The black bootlicks in the media are just one of them, and Ayanna Presley is another. 
This black bootlicking government is going to be reported on by a black bootlick on CNN like Don Lemonade or MSNBC like Joy Reid. And then they'll be cheered on by some black bootlick like D. Ray McKeeson or She the People. This is supposed to be what passes for black grassroots, at least as the white media tries to present it. Well, we've got to overturn this con. We have to dedicate ourselves to cleaning house. You cannot repair the black misleadership class any more than you can repair white supremacy. The festering black cabal of politicians who we are cursed with today are in fact inventions of white supremacy. White supremacy created the Congressional Black Caucus. And with this deep dive I've done into their membership, I hope it's a little more clear why that is. When I say white power has used its vast resources to create and set up entire constellations of black bootlicks to do their bidding, the congressional black talkers are just a prime example. Now, you probably thought that the problem was just limited to a few bad apples. Or perhaps it was just some people who didn't understand what policies we need because they've been inside the beltway too long. Or maybe it's just a few old men with a few old ideas that's the problem. Just old men with old ideas. The problem is the entire Congressional Black Caucus itself. Because they were created by white supremacy and not created by black empowerment. They are populated, staffed, and overrun with a whole bunch of people whose interests happen to be immigrants, LGBT, trying to make themselves acceptable to white power, anything except for black empowerment. That's the problem. We have no common bond with somebody like a Joe Neguse. We have no common bond with an Anthony Brown. We don't share any common ground with people like Stephen Horsford. We have no common ground with them. We have no common history. We have no common achievements. We have no common ideology. And we have no common goals. We are completely alien and separate to one another. We have to be honest about that reality. So why the world is it then that we allow these individuals to try to palm themselves off as one of us? It's because the definition of black basically was a polyglot. We allowed white power to basically say that anybody who's black basically is beneath us. And because of that, throwing them in with us, that somehow white power had no concern or no use for these immigrants or biracials when that wasn't true at all. White power didn't want them among them, but it's not that white power had no plans for them and had no use for them. White power was looking at these individuals who they threw among us as being tools to help disrupt our internal politics and throw us into disarray and keep us completely and thoroughly politically confused. And that's exactly what they've done. So these guys, they have served a very important purpose for white supremacy. Well, it's time for us to bring that purpose to an end. This is the reason why disengaging from the electoral fraud of American politics is so important. We have to have foundational blacks who have bent the knee and taken the pledge to black empowerment supporting and representing us. You shouldn't be voting for anyone unless that person came to you, bent the knee, and has taken the pledge. And he has to be a foundational black. That's just the reality. Because when you have a Stephen Horsford who shows up and his wife is sitting here talking that intersectionality crap, she shares no common ground with us. She's working against our interests. Stephen Horsford, if he wants to represent Trinidadians, let him go do that. And we'll see how many congressional seats he gets. And if Anthony Brown wants to represent the Swiss contingent of Americans or the Afro-Cubans, let, let him go down to Florida. He'll have to leave Maryland, that's for sure. He won't be able to find much voter support in Maryland. Let him go down to Florida. We'll see if he finds a big number of Afro-Cubans there. And then see if they can get him into any offices. No, let them represent the people who they share common ground with. And we will be represented by the ones who we share common ground with because the black community is no longer going to be a stepping stone to a life of comfort and wealth and privilege for some hand-picked con men and con women. That day is done. We are no longer going to be subsidizing our oppression by empowering those who white power sent among us for the sake of holding us down. The Congressional Black Talkers' job is to present the black community to the world as being one giant black mammy. On the plantation, the black mammy cared for everyone except for her own children. She took care of Mass's children, 
And if Massa had some next door neighbors, she would go ahead and make sure that their kids were nursed as well. She took care of everybody's babies except for her own. This is the job of the Congressional Black Caucus to present black people as caring about everyone else's interest except our own being concerned for everyone else's welfare except our own. Because when the white media presents somebody like a Cedric Richmond to the world saying, we got to care about the Vietnamese community. Well, when black folks are left with empty pockets, destitute in the streets, well, they can't be too concerned about that. Why their own representatives don't care. And when Maxine Waters and Kamala Harris are not out there on the war path for black people's tangibles. Well, when you look at Skid Row in Los Angeles, which is overwhelmingly black, that's where the black folks went to. You want to know what happened to the black community in L.A.? Check out Skid Row. That's where they all went. That's where they got sent to. But how are you going to be framing that in the terms of racial injustice when your own black representatives don't say boo about it? And that's the point. Black people chose these leaders and they don't say anything. Except the thing is, we didn't actually choose them. What happened was we took the path of least resistance. We didn't actually want these clowns, but the problem is we've been indoctrinated with the idea of you've got to vote, too many people have died, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then what happens is, instead of us fielding our own candidates, what happens is white power comes along and says, you don't have to, why, you got this Joe Neguse over here, and he's going to talk about how uh, hard it was for him as a black immigrant, but he'll only say black immigrant in front of you. When he gets in front of white folks, it'll just be immigrant, or he'll just be talking about how America did so much and he's so grateful. The Grateful Negro shtick is what he'll be doing for white people. He'll only talk halfway black when he's in front of you to see if you're silly enough to fall for it. And Kamala Harris will go ahead and sing you a couple of bars about how she was the second or third class to integrate her school, etc., etc. They'll do that. And then somehow you're supposed to think that they're down with the community. And you need to go and vote for them because somehow you're going to get something out of that. Politics is a business transaction, plain and simple, full stop, quid pro quo. You want my vote, I want tangibles. And an ongoing commitment to supply more tangibles. Because that's what voting is about. It's about who gets what. Out of, the, out of whatever resources the country has, how's it going to be divided? Well, let's hold a vote on it. That's what voting is supposed to be about. But it damn sure doesn't work that way for black people. And we got to put an end to that. Stop playing along with a game that is deliberately rigged so that you get left out. You got to take control of the situation. No more letting white supremacy present to you their slate of hand-picked puppets and then you choose from white supremacist candidate A or white supremacist candidate B. Time for you to change it and put a black empowerment candidate on the ballot. You cannot vote for any of these clowns anymore. Now that you know their freaking names, you can't be voting for these people anymore. What have the immigrants presented to us that is of such value that we should do something as monumental as condone them breaking the law by stealing their way into the country? Why the world should we be supporting immigration, period? What's in it for us? Ask the immigrants, what's in it for black people? What are you presenting to us as tangibles? What are you going to do for me? So understand that when it comes to the Immigrant Black Caucus, it's not even totally about their foreign ancestry. These guys, just as a group... They are tools of white supremacy, and that's why they that's how they see themselves. They see themselves as Latinos and immigrants and islanders and boule. That's how they see themselves. This is why they go nuts trying to represent immigrants, people who aren't even in their districts, but they go out of their way to ignore or even show open contempt for foundational black Americans. Now you see why the so-called Congressional Black Caucus doesn't give a damn about us, and they're always so eager to jump out there for immigrants because that's what these con artists are. The point of having a Congressional Black Caucus is supposed to be so that there's a group representing the interests of black people, starting with the ones who are already here and who have been here from day one. Instead, this gang of liars and con men are there to represent their home country or the ones their parents came from. They pride themselves on not being one of us. So we ought to make sure that this distinction is made loud and clear. These immigrant blacks simply cannot speak for us and they should not speak for us since they're so obsessed with immigrants, then that's who they need to go represent. But they cannot represent us. This immigration advocacy violates the will of the black community. 
Like it or not. And I know there's people who don't like it, but that's the way it is. We didn't vote for these guys to represent Latin America. We voted for them to represent Black America. While Ayanna Presley's asinine display disgusts me, it doesn't surprise me. White media is the mouthpiece for established white power. They see what we're doing and the impact that it's been having. So what you see is them trying to manufacture one high-profile media extravaganza after the next in the hopes of trying to get attention on their black bootlegs. This is white power's way of trying to counter-program. They see that we're reaching black folks, the right black folks, the black people who are going to get off their butts and change things. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to put up some distractions now. Oh, look, we got some actors and a couple of do-nothing academics. And they're saying that black folks don't need a check for reparations. That's the big message that got taken away from that con game, that fraud for reparations that took place on Capitol Hill a few weeks back. The takeaway, black folks, why we got some Negroes here who are saying that black folks don't want a check. In fact, they didn't actually say what black people wanted at all. That seemed to be the point. They see what we're doing. We are teaching our people the essential selfishness of survival, as Dr. John Henrik Clark beautifully put it. We've taught our people that it's not okay to support people who do not support us by name specifically. We've seen black bootlicks like Big Bird and Roly Poly and Goldie Taylor brought low. We cut the legs out from under presidential candidates. We're getting serious with all the people who have been attacking us. The only way to stop this process is if the white media can convince us that Donald Trump's Twitter tweets are more important than our tangibles. Trump doesn't represent your interests, but neither do the Democrats and definitely not these immigrants. We have no friends. None. Is Donald Trump a racist? Of course he is. But at least he's an honest racist, and I don't give him points for that. He's never going to get my vote. But that doesn't distract me. It doesn't fool me into thinking, oh, I got Donald Trump being a loud and proud racist. So that's certainly worse than these quiet and meek racists over here calling themselves Democrats. Neither one of them's on our team. So we're holding out for something better. We're holding out for a black agenda being pushed and presented by our own representatives. The problem the white media sees isn't our refusal to back immigration. It's our determination to push for economic power for ourselves. They absolutely have to get us off of that issue. So we see they're stepping up the propaganda. They're flooding the airwaves now and the online sphere with political theater like this. They have a gargantuan advantage in media outlets over us. So for every one video essay or one social media post that we put up, they can post a hundred or more lies. So how is it that we've made the progress on these pushing these issues that we've made so far? It's because we've got an equalizer. You. Yeah, the bad guys may have us outgunned, but we've got them outclassed. You've got to support the new voices of black media. If we don't push your interest, if we don't curate and direct the social discourse in the black community, then we go back to the toilet of Charlemagne the Fraud and Roly-Poly Martin doing all the talking. Now, what is to be done when it comes to chumps like Antonio Delgado, someone who has a foreign parent and someone whose bloodline also goes back to the plantations? What, what's to be done then? After all, didn't Malcolm have a foundational black father? Yes, he did. But let's not conflate the standard for reparations with the standard for whether or not we as a community will allow you to speak for us. Being eligible for reparations doesn't mean you're eligible for the black family's respect, and we have to get serious about enforcing that principle. You see, the reason that I started off with that Tigers of Tammany account was that you understand, yeah, the white guys were sitting here doing their little cosplay. We are Indian Braves and this is our wigwam, whatever. But when it came time to talk turkey, they were not talking in the terms of Native Americans. They were talking in the terms of Europeans talking about defending our country. Native Americans didn't believe in country. They didn't believe that you can actually own the land. And talking about will you defend and hold up our particular constitution. You see, they were talking about a value system. And that value system was and is white supremacy. 
That's what they wanted to be sure of. You couldn't just walk into the society of St. Tammany and say, I'm a good white man and uh, I think y'all all let me in. Show me the secret handshake. They'd be like, what's this society of St. Tammany you're talking about? What's this order of Columbus you refer to? We don't even know. What are you talking about? They would ignore you and they, pretend, they would pretend ignorance. Or they might decide to take up the freaking tomahawk and open your mind for you. See, they understand that there's rules and regulations that go along with every group. Every group has some standard of decorum, some standard of rules, some code of conduct. See, that's what the whole ritual by the Society of St. Tammany was meant to do. It was meant to begin the process of there's, there's a code of conduct that goes along with our group. That's why they said you're not to discuss what goes on here on the outside. What happens inside these walls of our wigwam, it stays here. And you got to be ready to die for this. That's what they pointed out. Are you ready to die for this? And that's the reason why they did it the way that they did. First question, is this stranger worthy of a seat among us? First order, first thing out of the gate, is this guy even supposed to be here? Man, what do we know about this fool? Who's his people? Who sent him? What are his credentials? And then next they asked, and this lets you know how the European thinks, He's, they asked, will he unbury the tomahawk from beneath the great wigwam before his country's good requires it? That's one of the things that Native Americans allegedly did. They bury a tomahawk in, into a, a tree, and the tomahawk is not to be retrieved until after the war is over. So right after the European asked whether or not this guy even should be here, the very first question is, is this guy ready to go to war? Let's you know what the European was thinking. This ain't about peace. This ain't about friendship. This ain't about Native American culture. This is about reinforcing the Europeans' war culture, because that's how he got the world and how he intends to keep it. So first order of business, is this guy ready to go to war and he ain't going to stop fighting until we've won, until we've taken everything that we want? And then next they asked, will he bear adversity, torture, and death in defense of liberty? Remember, liberty, I, I educated you guys on what liberty means. Liberty means power. Because everything that the European talks about as being their liberties, these are the things that black people recognize as being power. We simply talk about, oh, I want to be able to do what I want, etc. Et now, that ain't what the European means. It's a matter of I can take what I want, do whatever I want to whomever I want. And I have the ability to use unrelenting violence to get what I want. That to him is liberty. And I get to have my violence held on a pedestal and held up for glorification and worship. That's what he thinks of as liberty. What you think of as liberty, he sees as a threat. He should. But that's what they started off with. Asking, the, they started asking, letting this, putting people on notice. Should this guy be here? Is this somebody who's going to call for peace when we've already said we're going to war? Is this somebody who the enemy will be able to torture into submission? Is this somebody who will bear adversity for this group? Will he endure torture for this group? Will he die for this? You see, Tammany Hall ruled New York with an iron fist for 200 years. Everybody's familiar with Boss Tweed, but what they're not familiar with is the fact that Tammany Hall started 100 years before T Boss Tweed even came along. He was just the most corrupt one that they had, and Tammany Hall, at least in name, Tammany Hall endured all the way up into the 1960s. And by the way, before I forget, I do think that it bears noting that did you know that Tammany Hall actually had a black grand sackum? Now, I know that's going to come as a surprise to a lot of you guys. Did you know that? J. Raymond Jones. This guy was the first and only black head of Tammany Hall, which, of course, as we know with Barack Obama, when they sit there saying the black man's in charge, I mean, he ain't in charge of nothing. It was just them taking a last ditch effort at trying to, to sanitize their image. But Tammany Hall, yeah, they started off with a bunch of white guys cosplaying as Native Americans, and they ended with a black man cosplaying as a European. 
But you see what's going on here, though. Nonetheless, as far as they were concerned, there have to be rules and regulations. And do you think that the good Mr. J. Raymond Jones was not asked all the same questions that Mr. Morton was asked? Do you think they didn't ask him whether or not you're worthy to be among these good white men? Do you think they didn't ask him when we go to war with these black folks? Your relatives and friends and family, are you going to be calling for peace before white supremacy's through doing them in? Are you willing to endure whatever sort of indignity and questions? When the black community gives you a hard time, are you going to crack under pressure? Do you think they didn't ask him that? Yeah, white power believes that before they admit you into the group, they got to check you out first. You ain't just getting in because you show up. Black folks are the only ones who admit everybody sight unseen. That's how you wind up with Richard Aoki, the so-called Yellow Panther, an FBI agent getting into the freaking Black Panthers. That's how you wind up with black organizations who are riddled with spies and informants and double agents. That's how we wind up like that. No rules, no regulations, because as black folks, as far as we're concerned, everybody can just dump their casts off on us. We're accepting everybody. And we leave ourselves easy prey. Don't you think it's time for that to stop? See, our unconditional acceptance, we've extended it to practically everyone, and this is a mistake. We have to recognize this for the cultural failing that it should not be admitted to the group. Because a group that lets everyone in is nothing more than a circus. So that's how I feel whenever I look at members of the Black Immigrant Caucus who happen to have one parent who actually is may most likely be one of us and another parent born elsewhere. When I look at them, I'm looking and going, well, I don't know. I just don't know. Part of the reason that we're so riddled with backstabbers, bootlicks, and scumbags is because we allowed it to happen. People come among us just to see what they can get. We are nothing more than fools to be lied to, manipulated into this or that direction, and then ignored. And this by people who claim to be our representatives. If we actually had people pushing our agenda, we would have had a lot of things that we needed long before now. Ayanna Presley can get out there to do a press conference for immigrants, so why hasn't she and the rest of the congressional black talkers done a press conference pushing for reparations? John Lewis would get on the floor of the House of Representatives because a gay nightclub got shot up. Meanwhile, this guy's not doing any sit-ins after the Mother Emanuel Church massacre. You see the, any of them having a press conference pushing for a federal law to punish the police. The Gresham Black Talkers ain't doing that. None of them saying, well, if Barack Obama can sign a Blue Lives Matters executive order, then he can sign a Black Lives Matters executive order. They're like, oh, uh, no, we, we, we can't do that. Black folks are the very ones we're at war with. The Congressional Black Talkers are an arm of white supremacy. They are part of white supremacy's forward element. The white supremacy put among us for the sake of sabotaging our efforts, and they have done their job admirably. After we broke Kamala Harris's campaign, after we forced a congressional hearing on reparations, which was presided over by Sheila Jackson Lee herself, there's no member of the Congressional Black Caucus who can lie and say that they don't know that there's a major push underway for slave reparations from the black grassroots. They cannot say the reparation, that they don't know that reparations is a major grassroots issue for black people. They know it, and they're hiding from it. They're not moving on the issue. None of them are making it a campaign issue. None of them are running on the issue. None of them are supporting it. That's why I started off with the account of the Tammany ritual. These black migrants who came here to take advantage of the opportunities that we brought about and to legitimize this process of replacing us, they would try to lay claim to our history. They're walking in the shoes of white power who brought them here. They'll toss around some loose talk about the plantations, but that had nothing to do with them. They'll talk about the 13th and 14th Amendments, but those were the fruits of our struggles, not theirs. Sheila Jackson Lee's people didn't need the 13th or 14th Amendments. We did and still do. Stephen Horsford, his people didn't benefit from the Emancipation Proclamation, they weren't even here. So what the hell What the hell would he be talking about trying to laud the 14th Amendment and trying to talk about how important that is to black folks? It ain't important to him. 
Joe Naguse didn't need it. Ilhan Omar damn sure didn't need it. Kamala Harris definitely didn't need it. And yet they'll toss those things around because they know that they matter to you. These were the fruits of our labors. Roly Poly and Joy Reid, they love to toss around names like Shirley, like Shirley Chisholm and her political, all, her political accomplishments. But the only reason that Shirley Chisholm was able to even run for office or even had enough black support to win office was because of the 15th Amendment. But that wasn't Shirley Chisholm's accomplishment. And it wasn't the doing of her immigrant parents either. This was our doing, not hers. She had nothing to do with that. So it's a lie to act as if somehow the black vote and the benefits that she derived from it was somehow her achievement. This is the reality. These are the hard realities that need to be said. Because when we talk about foundational black, it don't just mean whether or not you've been here for a couple of days. You don't just get to show up and say, I went to Morehouse or I went to some other HBCU or some, some other do nothing school. And well, yeah, that means that now it goes for Brown v. Board of Education and the Voting Rights Act. Please tell me what Barack Obama's Kenyan father had to do with either of those things. See, the only thing Barack Obama's father was looking for was a white woman to snuggle up with. And apparently he found one. And when you're done finally facing facts as to what Barack Obama's father didn't contribute to the civil rights struggle, you can then go ahead and tell me what Kamala Harris's Indian mother had to do with the black struggle or her Jamaican father. What, what the world did they do to contribute to all the things that she takes advantage of? This is the most perverted form of historical revisionism, but white power has to do this in order to legitimize what is clearly nothing more than base thievery, theft of our history, and what we as a unique people have done, all for the sake of trying to legitimize the greatest crime in human history. By claiming why we didn't steal these blacks entire legacy and then wipe them out why why we got a couple of these black immigrants over here and why joy reed just got through telling us about how important the 14th amendment is to her and uh, kamala harris said that uh, she got bussed to school a couple of times so you know that whole brown v board of education we owe that to kamala harris we owe that to her family we owe that to her because that's part of what she and her folks contributed to this country that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to manufacture a legitimate basis by which to have their hand-picked puppets claim what we had done. Because when they do that, the one thing Joy Reid won't be doing is demanding reparations. The one thing Kamala Harris won't be doing is demanding that police be locked up for brutalizing black people. That's what they won't be doing. And that's what this is all about. It's meant to lay the groundwork for that. This continuing operation in order to scour us from the face of the earth. Foundational black Americans have changed the world. And now it seems everybody's always rushing to try to claim what we've done, whether it be in music, whether it be in fashion, whether it be in athletics, whether it be in social and political movements. We do all of these things, bring all of these new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things into the world. And then everybody else tries to jump on it and claim they had something to do with it when they didn't. Notice how all these Johnny-come-lately newcomers, these black migrants, don't carry the righteous anger that we do. They're not at all indignant nor looking for justice and righteous retribution for the greatest crime in human history. They talk in the same mamby-pamby, empty, mildly displeased way that white liberals do, because essentially that's what they came here to become. Joy Reid did not come here in order to become a foundational black American. She didn't come here to become a survivor of American slavery. She didn't come here for the sake of being part of our bloodline and being part of our, our group. She came here so she could be part of the same white liberal female sorority that she idolized from day one. That's the reason why Joy Reid is running around. And the same thing goes for Kamala Harris. We're trying to tear down white supremacy, and they're trying to solidify a position within it. So, this is the reason why tonight's video essay had to be. I've told you a million times, and I'm going to continue to harp on this one. It's about more than just being black in color. I've told you that, and I'm also here to tell you that it's about a hell of a lot more than your bloodline, too. 
Being black isn't enough. Oh, it's crucial. You gotta have it. That's the foundation. But it's not enough. And having an ancestor who was in bondage in the United States, that's not enough either. Because you may have the bloodline, but the question is, do you also have the bond? Being black in color means nothing without also being black in your mentality. You gotta have all of it. See, if you were to have a black empowerment version of the, of the Society of St. Tammany's Little Pathetic Ritual, first question would be, does this person have a black mind? Oh, I can look and see that his skin's dark and his hair is curly, but I want to know whether or not there's a black mind in there. That'd be the first question. And once you have a code of conduct for those in your immediate circle, naturally you're going to be extending that to everyone who you have any sort of contact or dealings with, including those who are seeking to get your support for whatever political office that they're hoping to achieve. What it comes down to is what standard are we using to select people who are going to lead us? What standard are we employing to choose the black people who we're going to choose to follow? As the B-1 Brigade, I want our standard to be the very highest. Do you think the Chinese are using a low standard? Do you think the Europeans are using a low standard? Do you think any of them are just dealing from the standard of unconditional acceptance? These other groups are making the right choices based on their interests. They know what they want and how to pick individuals who are working for them and not for other people. This is who we're up against, so if we keep picking two-faced con artists like Kamala Harris and the Immigrant Black Caucus or street corner hucksters like most black mayors are and other simple-minded clods, then we're going to go extinct as a people. We are not a stupid group, but damn if we haven't been making a lot of non-stop stupid decisions. And these other people, they've been coming among us and taking advantage of our generosity and frankly, our naivete. White supremacy has used foreign blacks as Trojan horses for their agenda to confuse our internal politics. And for 50 years, they've carried out their mission successfully. And then we came along, you and me, not just the black media, but those of you who are, are the fellow travelers of black empowerment. We came along and we've started to turn the tide, but we've only just begun. This is going to be a long term project, folks. Please don't think this is going to be over in 2020. Some of y'all who aren't built for this, you're waiting for the 2020 election so you can declare victory and then go back to playing Xbox full time and debating about who's beefing with whom. This is going to be the new normal for us. What's been going on here? This is going to be our discourse as a people. This is going to be what dominates our daily conversation. Are we gaining more power? Are we gaining more resources? If not, why not? This is the standard. We will enforce it both in the U.S. and abroad. Not merely with those who happen to be of European or Asian descent, but also with those who are of African descent and in the islands as well. This is going to be how we deal with everyone. Because when I look at Joy Reid, all I see is a white supremacist with a tan. This is about disciplining our team. So we have to be clear that the internal threats we face are a lot bigger than just some Johnny-come-lately like Kamala or Angela Rye with lettuce and tomatoes on the side or roly-poly. It's time for regime change in the misleadership class. Time to run them all out. Cut them off root and branch. I don't care how good or loyal or effective you think that your own beloved black politician is. They all must go. Even if you think well of this or that black politician, what you need to do is you need to be mature and serious about what you want. Thank them for their service, whatever you think that might be. Shake their hand and then send them on their way. We have to show everyone that there's a purge at work. We have to start from scratch. Because even your good black politician, they've got spouses or kids or family members who have been dependent on the current corrupt white supremacist system. They have all benefited from the white power system that they've been in office to serve.
We have to show that we're not taking chances with anyone. You see, whenever white power has a situation where they feel that a foreign government has committed some sort of act of espionage or undermined the interests of the United States, you know the first thing that they do to the foreign delegation is they tell all of them you have to leave. We declare you persona non grata. That entire diplomatic legation has to leave. All of them have to go. And we have to make sure that we are uncompromising in how we institute black empowerment. First thing we got to show is that we can force people out of office. If we don't want you there, you won't be there. We got to start getting tough with these guys. Why should anyone bend the knee to black power if black power does not demonstrate that there is an or else? I've been telling you about that for a long time. What is the or else? Do what we say or what? That's going to be their question. Well, if I don't, what what's, What are you guys going to do? Do what we say. Black empowerment has demands. You must follow those demands. You must carry out our demands. You must obey the demands of the foundational black Americans. And white power will simply look and say, or what? We've got to show the bastards the or what. We need an actual leadership class, one who we chose, preferably us. We need one who is ideologically steeped in black empowerment, not just some Johnny-come-latelys who have all sorts of questionable loyalties. We can't be sure what the hell they're loyal to. No, we can't play games anymore. All of this, we're trying to be liked by everyone, and we have to show unconditional acceptance. And, well, you know, white power's mistreating them, too. We got to stop making excuses for stupid choices. There is no black leadership class right now. We have the opportunity to start one from scratch, one that is built on our value system and adheres to our code of conduct and is promoting and aggressively pushing our agenda. We got to clear the bastards out. Don't make any excuses for that. White power's on the march, and they've insinuated a lot of people among us. Time for us to get serious about sending those guys packing and making it clear. We're going to send you right back to the same white supremacists who put you among us so they, that they can see that we have finally woken up, stood up, and are now charging forward.